here glad to be saved? Amen. Amen. Anybody here not glad to be saved? Okay, we'll pray for you. How about that? Oh, and by the way, I didn't want to pass this up. On the second row back, in the middle, second chair from the ocean, there's a guy that looks a lot from here up like Bob Coop. <laughs> but uh, I think he's really a mafia informant or something along that line. Isn't he sharp looking today? Yeah. And then over on the other end, you got the other cat with his coat and tie with this uh, classy outfit here. And then I forget the saying, I'm sure I'll get it wrong. A rose between two thorns? Is that how it goes? I pulled that one off. But anyway, good to have everybody here today. Uh, I appreciate being able to be here in church together Amen. on Christmas Day. Hallelujah. Also, um, Christmas, uh, I almost even hate to open the top of this jar up. Christmas has uh, taken some interesting turns down through the years. But uh, we still hold Christmas to be Christmas. A service about Christ. And, uh, he's the reason we have what we have, we act the way we act, so on and so forth. But it's good to be here together with fellow disciples this morning. I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bible to one of our favorite uh, Christmas passages, the book of Amos. <laughs> I just thought I'd see if anybody would catch that. Amos chapter 3. Amos chapter 3. You'll understand hopefully in just a few minutes. I'm going to read just one verse uh, from Amos chapter 3. This is one of those uh, messages, <clears throat> pardon, that I'll have to uh, share. If you like it, uh, I'll have to give credit where credit is due. And half of it came from Tommy Lee. I guess if uh, you like it, that means I've got to pay him some royalties. <laughs> if you don't like it, I'll blame it on somebody else. Uh, Amos 3, verse number 7. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. Let me read that one last time for me. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the the prophets. Let's pray together, if you will. Now, Father, we thank you for the opportunity. <coughs> I mean, it's so easy to say these words, Lord, but I know that they're coming from the bottom of my heart, and I know, feel sure I'm speaking for everyone in here today. We thank you for allowing us to be here together. I wouldn't even know where to start, Lord, uh, my list of why I'm so thankful. But I'm thankful. I'm thankful to be saved. I'm thankful to be amongst saved folk. I'm thankful that that word saved means just what it means, just what it sounds like. And I've seen nothing yet in comparison to what it will be. We long for the day when no longer will we walk by faith, but we'll walk by sight. Mm -hmm. So please help us today to remember that faith is, it, as it were, but a stepping stone for now. Yeah. Lord, we need you to take your word this morning and apply it to our lives. Mm -hmm. Only you can make any sense of it to us. Only you can make it relevant to our lives. Only you can make us get what's there, not what we bring into it. So please, God, preach your word to us today yes. that we may grow thereby. We ask it in Jesus' name and all God's people said. Amen. 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 I often think, uh, especially on the subject of Christmas, why God gives us the various details that he does. Uh, if you knew me from way back, even before I made my uh, debut singing, being a student's not my thing, never was. Uh, I think they had a graduation party after I graduated. 
I'm talking about the teachers. Uh, you ever heard of Deadwood? I ain't talking about where they had gunfights. I'm talking about where they're wasting good taxpayer dollars on somebody who don't want to learn nothing. That was me. It's being a student has never been my thing. I got saved and started to having an interest in the Word of God, and I read things in here, and I've come to believe, as you have come to find out, that uh, the Bible really is God's Word. God's not like me. He just doesn't run off of the mouth because there ain't nothing else better to do. He says something. It's for a purpose. So I think about the uh, details of this birth of Jesus thing the first time uh, he came. <laughs> Why he gave us the details, I don't know. But, but I, I don't want to miss any of them. Uh, and that's, of course, one of the reasons that we have preaching and teaching. Who here believes that the Bible is the literal Word of God? Amen. You don't have to embarrass yourself, but if you believe that, uh, it's a good thing to amen. The fact is, uh, a Bible believer's position on the Bible uh, is not nearly the mystery that some people like to make it out to be, those pie-in-the-sky-when-you-die folks are just a little bit all kilter. And if there's nothing uh, cloudy or dark about it to me, readily stated, easily grasped, clearly understood. We know as Bible believers that the Bible is, in fact, there are five words that I've come across through the years that helped me both to understand and to communicate to others about the Bible. One, inspired. The Bible is breathed by God. Two, it's inerrant. It has no errors whatsoever. It's infallible. Can't fail. It's in total. It will never be added to. It's interminable. It will never be outdated. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.16 explains inspired. All scriptures given by inspiration of God. Uh, Psalm 119, 160 explains inerrant. Thy word is true from the beginning. Isaiah 34, 16 explains infallible. The book of the Lord. Not one of these shall fail. In total, Deuteronomy 4, 2 explains uh, this. You shall not add to nor diminish aught from it. And Isaiah 48 explains interminable. The Lord, the word of, the, of our God, excuse me, shall stand forever. That's, that's why we feel the way we do. We get it right out of the book, you know. We didn't just dream this stuff up. We believe what it says. And that's why we do and think and preach like we do. The unbeliever says, yeah, but that's just what the Bible says. <laughs> but then the believer's response is, yep, yeah, that's exactly what the Bible says. And that's enough for me. Mm -hmm. We've come to realize that what it says is so. I've never known anyone who's tried something the Bible has said and it didn't work. Never. And I've been at it for a long time, you know, some of you have. The liberal says, yeah, but the Bible is not to be taken literally. The Bible believer says, yes, it is. Yeah. Just a choice that everybody has to make. Well, anyway, the Bible believer is just that, a Bible believer. And that's what brings us to our text this morning, Amos 3, 7. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophet. This morning, I'd like for us to notice three things from this passage. And I promise you, uh, I'll do what I can uh, with the Lord's blessing. It might work. It will work. Excuse me. But I promise I'll tie it into Christmas. Uh, but I'd like to begin with the third of these three things. Number three, Amos 3, 7, gives us the purpose of the Bible. The purpose of the Bible. It's how we hear from God. The Bible is how God speaks to us. The Bible is how we know what God wants and what God does not want. The Bible is how we know what he calls right and what he calls wrong. The Bible is how we know what will get us to heaven. The Bible is how we know what will take us to hell. That's why we have folks that love to hear the Bible preached and won't accept anything else. They know this is our source. 
I don't want anything muddying up the water. That's also, though, why we have folks that don't want to hear the Bible preached and won't attend a church that preaches it. The Bible is how we literally hear from God. This is the purpose of the Bible. God says, surely the Lord God will do nothing, but He reveals His secrets unto His servants, the prophets. Second thing from Amos 3.7 tells us that God has secrets. Being a Bible believer, uh, a literalist, uh, is really uh, mandatory for getting anything out of a passage like that. The word uh, secrets literally translates a company of persons in close deliberation. Uh, it comes from a word that means to sit down together and consult so what's being communicated to us here by this word secret uh, is intimacy, uh, an intimate assembly, intimate counsel, if you will. Or put it in other words, there are things about God that you simply can't know unless you draw close to Him. There are things about God that you simply won't know unless you sit down and intimately confer with Him. There are things about God you'll never understand unless you enter into that company of folks that lives in close deliberation with Him. There was a... Uh, a Baptist preacher, probably been gone 20 years now, maybe, if not for sure, the, the, the best Baptist preacher that I've ever heard in all my life, Adrian Rogers, made the statement one day that there were honest seekers and there were dishonest seekers. An honest seeker is someone who wants to know more about God. Of course, we know as Bible believers, even that's just a response. No man comes to the Father unless he's drawn. No man comes to Christ unless the Father draws him. So sure. you find yourself wanting to know more about God. Mm -hmm. Guess who's behind all that? Mm -hmm. So there's the honest seeker, someone who wants to know, but he's taking the time to be in the places and to be in the book that talks about God. He, he goes to church. She attends services. He reads his Bible. She asks questions because he, she honestly wants to know. But then there's the dishonest, or the, the not honest seeker, who says, yeah, oh yeah, I'd like to know about God. Want to know about heaven? Want to know about hell? Want to know about spiritual things? Do you go to church? No. you ever crack your Bible? No. I listen to Oprah. <laughs> and she may have something to say, y'all, on some subject. I don't know, and I'm not trying to impugn her. The time or two I've sat down and studied what she had said. I ain't heard nothing that has anything to do with how to get me to heaven. Mm -hmm. And on the subject of spiritual things, that's all I care about. I don't want to be a guru, and I don't want to join a club, but I want to make sure when I draw my last breath that I go somewhere that the Bible describes as paradise. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's really all I care about there. So there are those who really want to know, those who really, really, really no big deal to them, but that's where this concept of God having secrets, and to me, the, the need for definitions there, if you want to know something from God, about God, you're going to have to get up close to Him. You're going to have to, to want that intimacy with Him. Now again, this is where the proverbial bear begins to come down the tree. There are some of us who know enough about God to know, well, I don't want to get but so close because God's kind of the type that wants to get in your business. <laughs> Did any of you find out things about your spouse after you said, I do? Nobody in here, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Got one man grumbling over there. Right? He's a cat that don't remember when he got married. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, uh, men, you take a spouse unto yourself. 
I don't know whether she covered all this territory before you got hitched up or not, but from this point on, it's going to be exclusive. Everybody know what exclusive means? Mm -hmm. Look it up in the dictionary, and it'll tell you if you touch another one, I'll break all your fingers. <laughs> Anybody know what I'm talking about? And ladies, it's the same way. You don't want to see him over there flirting with somebody. I won't mention no names, but somebody told me one time, I'll scratch your eyes out. <laughs> I had to stop and consider that. I didn't know what that meant, y'all. But it don't sound good. Huh? So some people don't want to get but so close to God, because God, and you I don't mean any disrespectful there, they know enough that God's going to get in your business. You can't do like you want to do and be intimate with God. You don't have to do what God says. You don't have to be intimate with God. But if you want intimacy and personalness with how, why is it some folk you come into church service and the first thing you know they're weeping tears are running down their cheeks or they're sitting over there looking like in the middle of a dead service they're having church all by their lonesome how do things like that happen how can you meet someone in Walmart in Kmart on the side of the road at whatever place of business and they just seem to have a glow about them, and they want to talk about God in the middle of who knows what. What ails that person? Well, what ails them is they probably got a real good dose of intimate knowledge of God. You say, well, I don't even believe that so. Well, I've got to tell you, this. you get up close and personal with them, and you'll find out there's something to it, y'all. It happens down here. It's the best thing I've ever known. And it just seems to be getting gooder and gooder all the time. Christian life is full of heartache, y'all. I wish it won't, but it is. But all the while, it's like you can slow down for a minute, back up a step or two, and there he is. Amen. And then you realize what he meant, what he was communicating when he said, Lo, I am with you. Oh, and you're crying. I'm there. <clears throat> when you're hurting, I'm there. When you're afraid, I'm there. When you don't know what in the world is fixing to come next, I'm there. Now, I wish he'd erase all four. But that ain't what he wants to do. He wants us to learn that whether there be four or a hundred and four, he's there. <clears throat> And you get to the point where that starts having an effect on you. It starts influencing. You still have the tears and the pain, the fear, the anticipation, but you, there you stand. Why? Well, because he's with you. It's a wonderful thing, though. So we've got to, to get the secrets, we've got to be up close and personal with it. Now, that, on the other hand, the negative side of this thing, or why they're professing Christians who still act like lost folk. And that's why you'll find at times professing Christians who act like lost folks and when they hear a disciple say, well, you know, I go into my prayer closet every day. Uh, I'm, I've become a student of the Bible. I, I am faithful to my church. I have attempted to do what the Bible says, to come out from among them and be separated from the world. They hear that and they look at you like you just landed from Mars. What's the matter with you? Well, what's the matter with me is I believe that the Bible is the Word of God and I'm starting to take counsel from that thing. I'm going to do what it says. I'm going to reap benefits too. It's a wonderful thing. But it's folks like this that don't realize that God has secrets. So you, the disciple, you're daily confiding in Him conferring with them, comparing your habits, words, actions, and attitudes with His unchanging Word, the Bible. And in that thing, you're finding that God really does have secrets. And the more intimate you become with Him, the more of those secrets you find out. And then finally, number one, Amos 3, 7 tells us that God does nothing without first telling His prophets. Now that's what it says. 
And I'm grateful for that because I would question it were not in the Word of God. First, a couple of definitions for clarity. Number one, surely, this is a sure thing. It's not maybe, could be, might be, or should be. God always does this. That's what His book says. Now hang on to that because I'm going to take it somewhere. Number two, nothing. There are no exceptions to this. Whatever God's fixing to do that affects people on earth, He tells prophets about that. That's a secret that went in the Word. That's what he says. The third definition, though, revealeth, revealeth. But he revealeth his secret to his servants. The word literally means to denude or to completely strip. In other words, when God tells what he's going to do to those who are intimate with him, they see it all. They get a complete picture. And I don't know of a better example of God doing nothing without first telling His prophets, Christ first come. What's the first book in the Bible, somebody? Genesis. Genesis. God said there would be a Messiah coming, a chosen one, an anointed one. Genesis 3.15, God told Satan, He told Eve, and He told Adam, that the woman would have a seed. Now it's interesting to me that he did not say that the man would have an offspring. He said that this woman would have a seed and that this seed would bruise the head of Satan. Thus he would be unlike every other person. Now from creation to a crucifixion, every other person obeyed Satan. No bruising there. Isaiah said it's like sheep going astray, wandering away from God. But from Bethlehem to Golgotha, there was one who did different. His name was Jesus. And then on Golgotha's hill, we're told that he destroyed him that had power over death. That is the devil. That was the seed. God said it from book number one. Genesis 49, 10. God told Jacob that Shiloh, would come. Shiloh means tranquil. And those who want tranquility, peace, will gather to him, is how the King James puts it, in obedience. And that's that seed. Joshua 5.14, God showed Joshua that this Messiah, this captain of the Lord's host, in his presence would be holy ground. That was this seed. 2 Samuel 7, 12, God told David that this seed would be God's son. And in Psalm 2, 2, God told David that this seed would be God's anointed, his Mashiach, his Messiah, <coughs> if you will. So first of all, God said that there would be a Messiah coming. But secondly, he said what this Messiah would be. Isaiah 9, 6, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder, his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Not just a great, a great song, a passage of scripture uh, put to lyrics uh, by George Friedrich Handel. But it lets us know that this seed would be the Son of God. He would be Lord of all. He would be God Almighty. He would be one with the Father. He would be the only ever means or Prince of Peace. 9-7, He would be the ruler over God's kingdom forever. But God also said, Isaiah 53, verse 3, He, the seed, would be despised and rejected of men. He would be a man of sorrow. He would be acquainted with grief. He would be treated as an outcast by his fellow men. 53.5, he would be wounded and bruised for our sin. 53.7, he would be oppressed and afflicted. 53.8, he'd be killed. 53.9, he'd be buried with wicked people. But God also said in 53.10, he would live again. By the way, do you know of anyone else that these uh, facts could ever have applied to? Of course not. It's an amazing thing. 
God said that there would be a Messiah coming. God said what Messiah would be. Thirdly, He said how Messiah would come. 714, book of Isaiah, He'd be virgin born. Number four, He said where Messiah would be born. Micah 5, 2, be born in Bethlehem. Number five, He said why Messiah would come. 1 John 3, 8, He would come to destroy the works of Satan. Number six, that Messiah would have a forerunner. Malachi 3.1. He'd have a messenger to prepare the way before him. You remember who that was? Isaiah 43, that this messenger would be in the wilderness or in the desert crying. But God even said when Messiah would come. Galatians 4.4, 4, when the fullness of time was come. And to the Bible student, we realize what's meant there is what, when, what all that needed to take place had taken place. When all the prophecies that God had given had happened, when all that God had foretold about Messiah had come about, when all the time that God had allowed had passed, that Messiah would come. And He did. But one last detail. That's really what point I wanted to leave us with today. Number eight, God told us how Messiah would be received. You would think with all of this announcing that they'd have called the band out and been partying for weeks, wouldn't you? Isaiah 53 verse 2 told us, as you of course know, that he would be born unexpectedly. <coughs> Despite all these prophecies, 53.2, he would be born in obscurity, despite the fact that he's king of kings. How could that be? 53.2, he would be born with no one desiring him, despite the fact that he would one day be referred to as the friend of sinners. Anybody here glad that he's the friend of sinners? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's the only way I ever know. <laughs> Promise you that, buddy. In 53.1, book of Isaiah, he would be born amongst folks who do not believe God's prophets. Isaiah said, who hath believed our report? The bottom line here, y'all, is that God did everything just like he said he would do. And folks were still surprised. And folks still didn't believe. And folks still were not interested. Well, why is that? I'd suggest to you, to me, it's because God has secrets. In order to know those secrets, you've got to be intimate with Him. And to be intimate with Him, it requires walking what the Bible calls the straight and narrow. I don't know how many times I've heard uh, in my life as a pastor, well, I tried it, but it didn't work. Or I asked God for help, and He didn't give it to me. And I know from those individuals' vantage point that there's a truth to what they said. It's a small one. But that's like someone saying, we uh, were in a business meeting many, 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 many years ago. Somebody made a comment about the benevolence fund. And one of the sisters turned around and looked at me and she said, What benevolence fund? I didn't know we had a benevolence fund. I didn't tell them, but I wanted to. I, said, I thought I wanted to say, Well, that doesn't surprise me since you come to church every 14th blue moon. <laughs> no wonder you don't know about the benevolence fun, you know, show up to church. Straight and narrow is what Jesus called the Christian life. Someone says, I tried it, it didn't work. You didn't try it, or it would have worked. You didn't get hooked up with the right source, or you would have gotten your answer. I promise you that. You're going to have to take my word for it if you're here today and not a disciple of Christ, not a believer, not a Christian for real. Yeah. Y'all, God answered prayer. Amen. Yeah.
But you're going to have to get it straight in there. If you really want it. 2,000 years ago, on the first Christmas, of all the countless thousands in Israel, of all the professional clergy that served, Scripture indicates quite probably that there were less than a dozen folks gathered at Bethlehem State. Tommy mentioned last night, well, we didn't have a big crowd. He said, but I think we probably had more here than it was in Bethlehem. <laughs> I said, I think you're right, brother. And we ain't got to count on the sheep and the goats and the donkeys and the mules and the whatever else. It's... But can you imagine? Now, God's perspective on this thing was to first send out, I wish I had a better word, but one of his hit men, Gabriel. The word means, literally means, strong man of God. I can't help but think that's the reason God sent Gabriel to do what he did. He first confronted a priest. And in so many words, a rough translation of uh, Luke chapter 1, about verse 13 and following, you ain't going to believe what God's fixing to do, Austin. And of course, Zacharias believed everything he told him, right? No. Wrong thing to tell strong man of God. He knew how to tend to folks that don't believe. Hey, no problem. You just won't open your unbelieving mouth for the next nine months. How about that? What y'all are praying will happen to me sometime. Then he sends the same strong man to the virgin girl. And how can this be? I, I mean, I know enough about biology. It ain't going to work. No problem. Hey, the power of the highest will overshadow you. Now God ain't never done that before. God's done some amazing things, but never that. And then, y'all icing on the cake, the next time we hear about God doing anything, he sent a crowd of angels out on the hillside, and they put on a concert for some shepherds. This is how God felt about him coming the first time. Mm -hmm. And nobody showed up. Nobody showed any interest. I'm going to stop with this. I wonder what it will be like at his second coming. Will you pray with me? <clears throat> oh, what a thought. And I know I'm the guiltiest that there is. I'm not pointing any fingers at anybody else. God, from experience, I know what it's like to be distracted. I know what it's like to fall for foolish lies. I know what it's like for things, people, places, persons to exert influence and take me away from the straight and narrow. I know all about those things firsthand. I still can't fathom how me and those like me would know that you were coming the first time and not even bother showing up. <clears throat> I really do wonder what it'll be like. I say that tongue in cheek. <coughs> what it's going to be like, Jesus, when you come the next time. But Father, back to our purpose here this morning. Fact is, you did send your son. Fact is, he was born of a woman. But not by means of a man. He was virgin born so that he could be man and yet be God. He could be God man. And with all else that that means that I haven't a clue about, 
It means that he was going to live like me. But he was going to show me you. And yes, he died. Paid a debt. But yes, he rose again. Father, thank you. There may be someone here today, Father, who has <coughs> toyed with these facts, but has never embraced them. We here today, Lord, who know you and trust you and long for your presence, join our prayers together and in a way not condescending and not condemning, ask you to please show, be there one, two, three, be there any here today who know the facts but have never submitted to them. God, please don't let a person walk out of here today who by faith has not welcomed Jesus both at the manger and the cross. Help that person, God, to turn control of their life over to the God-man, King of kings, Lord of lords, soon returning, God Almighty. Your word promises that you'll forgive every sin, that you'll break every bad habit, that you'll turn us into your adopted children. Please, God, grant the confidence that anyone here that fits that bill can leave here today a different person. We pray in Christ's name. I'll ask if you will to remain praying, heads bowed, eyes closed.